the streets. This is a festival I was curating as, uh, in Guadalajara, Mexico, where we're doing projection mapping of a photo booth pictures that we were doing on this old theater at uh, Guadalajara. We were working with the city, which they were, we were inviting artists from New York to come and do work at, the, at this festival. The interesting part of that was that we had space and we had resources and we could ask the city, could you please turn off the lights, the street lights, so we can project our little tiny pictures in the theater? And they would say yes. And this is also the second largest city in Mexico, so it was very interesting to see these pictures of this work that people create here in Brooklyn, New York. How can we expand them? And then they would come back and do them here in New York City as well. So I'll show you a quick video. This is uh, it's projection mapping as well, bringing digital into the physical space. And I let the video show you more. Uh, me talking. So this is a project by uh, an artist, he's, uh, by, by Park, Matt Parker and Albert Huang. Uh, this is what they presented in 2012. It's been a while. You can see. This is the largest volumetric display that's been made. Uh, at least that's uh, that's what we know. It's a lot of yarn. You see all these threads of the mini jar, and they were projecting on every single thread, making sure the projection was mapping on every single thread, and you could walk around it. And it was quite interesting just to sit down underneath that space. It was very meditative space. You could sit down and just look up, so you'll see it later. In, in my mind, it looked a lot like fireworks, just digitally controlled fireworks. You see all these people walking around it. festival that was going around for six years. I, came, uh, I was working here in New York as a teaching artist with the Queens Museum. Has anybody been to the Queens Museum? Come on, you have to go. It has the largest. <laughs> it's uh, very close to La Guardia. It's very close to City Field. So uh, very close to the US Open. It's like next door to the US Open. So if you're ever around that area, they have the largest 3D map of New York City. Basically like Google Maps, but in physical form. It's like, it takes over I can't remember how much square footage, but it's basically one of the main galleries of the museum. It also shows you a little bit tapping into the New York State uh, Gulf website. It shows you where our water comes from. You, we, we, you all know that we have the cleanest water, supposedly, or this allegedly, depends on the pipes on your buildings and whatnot. But we do have the cleanest water. We do have the cleanest water, and it's coming from a reservoir that's being guarded by the national police to make sure we get the cleanest waters. The pipes, I don't want to even know what's going on there. Uh, so this is, the, uh, this is the site for the 1939 and 1964 World's Fair. Uh, you won't see it here, but that's the towers that you might have seen in uh, Men in Black, uh, when the spaceships take off from that. That's the New York State Pavilion, and this is the New York State Pavilion de uh, designed by Philip Johnson. And, what, and he covered the pavilion with artworks that were very prominent in the very uh, productive in 1964. This is one by Andy Warhol, uh, which right now actually, by the way, is just starting an exhibition at the Whitney Museum. There's a very good show about Andy Warhol. So this is a, a, a painting he did on this, uh, on this building, showing the most wanted men of, of the United States. They were all criminals. And for me, what I find really interesting about this, uh, I'll, it more. Let me tell you, it's a long story, so let me show you. So this was censored at the time because of the state governor, the New York state governor. He didn't like to have criminals being showcased to the world, so it was painted over. Uh, all these screen printings of the original men were dispersed around the world because it was Andy Warhol. Some ended in Paris, some ended in different countries around the world. When I was working at the Queens Museum as a visitor experience manager, all the Warhols came back 
And at the time I was also in charge of security. So I had to lock the doors at night and make sure the warhols were not stolen. <laughs> Remember, believe me, that was a very bad month in my life. It was like, <laughs> my goodness, did I really lock it right? <laughs> uh, this happened, I was running, managing a team of security guards at the time, but they were also in charge, they were called visitor experience agents. They were in charge also of making sure people would have an educational experience when they came to the museum. So instead of telling you, please don't touch that artwork, they would tell you history about the artwork. Instead of slapping your hand, they would actually tell you things. Mm -hmm. Also to make sure that the museum was a welcome experience, we tried to get a very diverse staff. Queens, as you know, is the most diverse borough in New York City. So we hired making sure that the staff would reflect that community. So when we were giving the, the when we were getting the tour from the curator about this show, we asked, so what about this man? Uh, do, we, do we have any relatives of these people, especially now with DNA and all these things? Do we have anybody related to these people? And the curator was obviously with what she knew, she would say like, well, nobody really wants to be related to these people. Why would you want to be related to their criminals? They're the most wanted men. Like, Sorry, yes, I get it. So we went back and suddenly uh, one day, one of the uh, agents calls me like, Marco, please come to the floor. I'm like, oh my, what's, what's happening in the floor? So I come down and she tells me like, that person there, he's the son of one of the most wanted men. He tells me like in secret, like, oh my goodness, this is the great news. We were working with the Queen's Library. <laughs> It is great news, oh, come on. It is, it is, somebody like, comes back, and then we were working with the Queen's Library recording stories. So we were uh, getting people to talk about the World's Fair and how they find their first boyfriend, girlfriend, marriage, whatever. They were telling us all these stories, these uh, very old people sometimes. So we, so we interviewed the person, uh, then we called the, at the time also, uh, I'll step back, at the time also the Jackie Kennedys, you've all seen Andy Warhol, he painted Jackie Kennedys and Marilyn Monroe and all these very beautiful portraits. It was also there in the gallery, so we had a beautiful show about Warhol. Uh, we called the New, the New York Times, the Times was like, interested in the story, and this is the, this is the son of the criminal, you can see they're related. Uh, <laughs> there's no denying that. <laughs> I mean, like there's no, there's no Photoshop or anything. But it was quite interesting to hear his story. You can go in online and hear it. He was abandoned when he was a child with his, with his sister at a church and a policeman raised him. So just, I mean, it was very interesting to see how his life gave a three, uh, 180 degree, 180? Yeah, not 360, 180. 180 degree turn. Uh, he grew up kind of knowing, not knowing until somebody told him like, yeah, this is who your dad was and gave him all the newspapers and all those things, like the big review. So he came back, he knew about this show through the New York Times. He said, like, the wife was like, this is your dad, right? Like, this is the person you've been talking to. So they came back to see it. When the interview happened, uh, this, this is a reporter who came, Tatiana Schlossberg. It was quite interesting to see that uh, the criminal photo was there. Jackie Kennedy was on the other side of the gallery. The reporter was the granddaughter of Jackie Kennedy, who was interviewing this, uh, the, the son of uh, George Schlossberg which to me it was very interesting to think of the museum as a time machine, but so you were connecting all these people in time and space to make sure they were talking to each other, but at least that was me in my head. Uh, I like to tell that story because it was very beautiful just to see all of these things together. Mm -hmm. They did know each other, he didn't know that he, uh, she was the granddaughter of Jackie Kennedy, so it was quite interesting just to think about that. Cut to, I started working at the Met Museum. I was running the media lab, so we were our mission was to imagine the possible futures of museums and culture. We didn't want to think of just one future, we wanted to make sure there were many futures possible. And we were looking at the museum as a narrative ecosystem, how they inhabit that same physical and digital space that we can experience it, remix it, and approach it through different angles. It's not just one, it's many collections, many times through different angles that we can approach it. This is one uh, has can I ask again who's been to the Met? Can I please see more hands? It's closer. Uh, as you all know, both museums are free for New York City residents. I won't get into the controversies around that, but at least right now for New York City residents, you get to enter for free. If you go to the north side of the museum, this is the Temple of Dender that was brought to New York City uh, 50 years ago. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks just to throw in more 60s references there by thanks a lot to the efforts of Jackie Kennedy, 
who there's an urban legend that says that she is an apartment overlooking this space, and that's why the temple of Delta is there. I don't know if that's true, but it's quite convenient. If you live in a tavern, you want to have this view of the museum. Why not? So we're working on this. As you can see, the building right now is very beige. It's very uh, sadly looking. Uh, we were working with projection, uh, with, again, back to projection mapping, working with technologists and the research team at the Met, the Egyptian Art Department. We did this project, bringing back the colors of the museum, uh, the mm -hmm. colors of the temple. This is the later period of the temple when they added these stripes. Before that, it was very blocky, very solid colors. And I'll show you a very quick video. This has no sound, don't worry a second. So you'll see the, how it's been traced, all the lines. This was done by two grad students, one from ITP, one from Parsons, Design and Technology, and a PhD student. This is a very solid color, the earlier version. This is the second version, later in time. It was quite interesting to think of this space as a flexible space, as a, you could show version one or version two, uh, and you can just do it on your, with your remote control. When we did this, I was fixing, I was, uh, fixing this project. Um, this docent, uh, this lady who's been giving tours at the Met for a long time, comes with, with a frown. She sees the colors on the temple, and come, I'm like sitting down in the laptop, like trying to get the thing running for, for the, for the people. She's very angry. I mean, kind of like concerned. Like, who did this? Who? who why is this painted? <laughs> like, sh one of the things I was managing a team, so it was mo very much like. I get the blame, people get the praise. Like, so I was like, me? <laughs> yeah, but they're the wrong like, But I told her, like, I can turn it off. So I turned it off, and then she smiled, like, oh, can I have the remote control now? Like, no, no, hold on, come on. Like, <laughs> not too fast, not too fast now. Like, you want so it was quite interesting just to see how somebody's perception could be changed in, uh, in the physical space just like that. Uh, this project obviously took a long time because at the Media Lab we, had, we worked a lot with pro bono uh, researchers. Uh, it took around one year uh, to be made and one year to prototype and launch to the public. We launched it first for the researcher, for the PhD student. She, that was her PowerPoint and keynote. That was, must be really cool to be like, oh, let me show you my keynote. It's this <laughs> temple. Uh, Erin Peters and Matt, uh, Matt Felsen and Maria Paolo Saba. Then we showed it for teenagers. They were able to, with an iPad, change the colors of different versions that I showed you. Then we showed it permanently at the, at the Met for three months during the winter from January to March, and it got extended. Uh, the, the interesting part was that for a very small team at the Met, basically, at some point it was me and a lot of volunteers and people who were interested in the project. We made it to the New York Times uh, with this project, and it was quite interesting to think. For that, they thought that it was an exhibit that had been funded the whole thing, but it was just mainly, pe mainly people experimenting with technology and a little bit hacking and a little bit guerrilla putting the projector in the galleries. So that was quite interesting that we made it there. How did we start looking at the museum? We started looking, uh, what other experiments could we do with the museum? How do we look at the user journey? What are the pain points? What are the, the, the pleasure points? How do we bring, bring the light to the museum experience? This is another project by Emily McAllister. Uh, every time somebody would open a browser on Chrome, and when you open a tab, you would get a picture of a cat from the museum. <laughs> uh, it's not a great breakthrough, but I think it was very successful. The internet loved it. Uh, within one month, we increased the traffic to these cat pictures, of these cat images, up to 50% in leading one picture to these images. And in one month, also for a very small team, we we got 6,000 downloads, which again, it was a big deal for us. Uh, just that people randomly going, okay, let me download this. Then we made other extensions uh, talking about weather. Like every time it was raining, you would get a picture of the net, an image from the net that would show that it was raining at the, at the museum, or if it was sunny. So we were playing around how can we use extensions. Another project, uh, anybody know what this is? Do you remember the 35 millimeter slides? We've been talking old school technology. I don't, I don't mean to, I know, I, I, I did see this. The museum had a, before the museum had a online library, they had these slides for researchers and professors would call and, can you please give me a war, an image of the war from the Matisse and the Van Gogh, please, and send them over to my university in the middle of Indiana. And they would send them, there would be somebody picking the slides and sending them over. So when the, the museum went online and, and digitized all their images, these images, they were left over. Basically, they, they were in my space where the lab was, 
start pushing boxes and suddenly we ended up with a lot of a lot like a thousand thousand slides uh julia who's here helped us like box and box and unbox mm -hmm. a lot of them so working with materials for the arts uh an amazing organization in Orlando city who repurposes materials that's what they do for artists and educators they invited many artists amongst them uh, james sheen who made this uh installation at the at Pioneer Works, where you could walk through images, basically turning a very, what it was a physical uh, experience, like that. <laughs> and you could just walk around and see how the light refracted into this. The interesting part with it uh, is not that we were trying any all the time to be making it to the times, but this was uh, <laughs> we made it again to the times because of the connections. How do we bridge old technology with new technologies, and how do we make stories with them? Uh, what I find also quite interesting about this project is that Jin Shin went on to do more projects like this with BAM, with other institutions, and she is now setting up a permanent installation of this of this project at Facebook headquarters. Just talking about memories and how like, how do we remember things, which I find quite interesting. Uh, so with that, I mean, I'll tell you a bit of it. I'll borrow this from Red Burns, who's the founder of ITP, the program that uh, we talked about earlier. Uh, she started the program, like arts and technology program, 30 years, 30, probably, 40 years ago? Probably 40 years ago, uh, when the porta pack camera came around, a big porta pack camera that was a very, very big democratizing technology. And she had some part in making community television in New York City possible, having that fun for community television, which is very weird, but it's also where cool things have come out of, including Basquiat and many others in the 80s. So she, she would, there's many things that she would say in her class. There's a very beautiful presentation that she talks about. So she would say, take the, uh, you, can, that you make whole pieces out of disparate parts. So that's a little bit of what I've been doing. And for my thesis project, this is what I uh, was trying at ITP. People call it the Center for the Recently Possible. People were doing Arduinos and, and technology and telepresence. I really wanted to, I really found that food was the one thing that really connected us. Like that was amazing technology to have a beer with somebody and see all the senses and inputs that we would have with all our bodies. And at the lab, we would say that humans are the most amazing technologies, at least the ones that function right. With some humans that are really, we should return them. Uh, <laughs> um, there's no guarantee, I don't know where, but normally humans are pretty good. So uh, also talk, uh, I also looked at plants, meaning that we're looking at not solar technology. We're very excited right now when we can get a solar panel to charge our cell phones because you put it in your backpack and you walk around, no shade to anybody, but you should charge your cell phones. Plants, they just get the, sun, they get the sunlight and make sugar out of it like this, and they look pretty in the, in the mm -hmm. process. Uh, so I really wanted to see how do we get more parks in the city, how do we get more plants? I don't have a uh, real estate. So then I looked at the, at the top of city buses, like, oh, let's use the top of city buses to start gathering rain, capturing rain, mm -hmm. turning pollution into oxygen, and also creating habitats for other species. Uh, sad, I mean, true story, humans are not the only ones in this ecosystem that we live in the planet. We cannot just always be human-centered design. I really like more <coughs> that we design for other species as well. What would it look like if we turn their parking lots into parks and be like a network of moving buses around the city? So that one day you could be waiting for the bus if our buses function better. Uh, or at least we'll be waiting for buses in Williamsburg next year. So, <laughs> sorry. Sad story, happy Halloween. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you're waiting for the bus and suddenly Oh, I missed my bus. Oh, but I get the lavender smell because that, la that was the lavender bus that I just missed. But I'm relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> or I can get the basil. I can get the basil. So I've been doing different prototypes. Uh, I started with the science, the bio bus, the science lab on wheels. Uh, then we did a food truck in St. Louis that had very much edible plants and uh, basil, strawberries, uh, weeds, native plants as well. Uh, so when I left the media lab, back to Red Burns, when you get disparate parts, how do you put them together? So that's what I did. I started, how do I start looking, how do we bring innovation, the thing that I was looking at the media lab, virtual reality, projection mapping, uh, digital design, how do we bring it to the streets? And why not talk about green technology and put it on a food truck, just like, a, a, like just food trucks they do, that they've been doing that. Uh, so we've been doing these renderings. We prototyped last year in Central Park and in Staten Island for future storytelling. 
uh, we did this project with an ice cream truck, putting, uh, putting a garden on its roof, and a virtual reality station inside to allow people to paint their favorite plants inside. Then we went to Mexico and prototyped it again, again, we're going from uh, an idea, paper, prototyping and prototyping, just like a temple of desert. How do we go from stages? People would go here in Mexico, there was, uh, we served 20 locations around the city, back in Guadalajara. Uh, 1,500 people were trying to brush for the first time. They were imagining their first plant that they see, or their favorite plants. Many times it would come back to their grandmothers or a lot of uh, female uh, uh, mother role models, and they would draw them. They are not, uh, obviously, illustrations that would be worthy of uh, other one, but, uh, but still it's uh, an interesting exercise in understanding 3D space. Uh, there with a bunch of uh, a great team that was helping with the truck over there. Uh, right now I'm back in New York trying to create a network, uh, creating connective tissues. How do we connect different labs around the city? So I'm a, a professor at Columbia University in the anthropology department talking about arts and technology. Uh, that. Uh, at the journalism school at the Brown Institute for Media Innovation and NYU at the Institute for Public Knowledge. How do we use arts and technology to talk to change behaviors around food security and climate change? And next semester, I'll be starting at New York College of Science, creating another prototype to bring this knowledge to use a truck to move around the different points and connect them. Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the ride all over the place, but uh, if you have any questions, please. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? I just have a suggestion, you know, on the buses, you already have this grass, so might I could put some lawn chairs and people can sit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, I mean, it, it, I don't know if uh, plants are actually more adapted to movement. People, apparently, we don't like change that much. <laughs> plants don't mind change. But you see those tourist, tourist buses and people are sitting on top anyways, right? Well, if you know anybody with the double-decker buses, that would be amazing to create a picnic. Uh, Sam, if you want to do a picnic sometimes on the double-decker buses, with better, better weather, I'd be down to <laughs> So that's one thing. Also, when I presented this project in different iterations, uh, people have suggested uh, growing wheat, and that would be great to fundraise the project, uh, especially if I did it in Colorado or something like that. I have, I, I, I'm not into that. I, I don't know how to, I don't know the business model <laughs> for that, but uh, thanks for that. Um, with a lot of the projects that you presented, they were very long term in terms of the amount of time that they took, so I was just wondering how you kept yourself motivated while you were working on those projects and uh, while you were working on multiple projects at the same time. I think, for instance, for the Media Lab, that's one thing I understood more how to do it, because museums can move very slowly, whereas the startup uh, agencies, the startup, uh, startup companies can move very fast, and it's all about iteration. But I was, I find myself apparently like in the delta, like where the two streams of water meet, uh, and it's more like, okay, we're going from one place to the other, and I can see something that's going very cool in the agency side, but then I go to the museum side or it's like something very interesting is happening. So going back and forth like a transducer, changing one energy to the other. So finding motivation in different parts of this. Yeah. When you work with the projection mapping, do you always work for clients or do you do any art for yourself? I, I, I work uh, I work most, mostly as a transducer producer, helping people do the projection mapping. Uh, uh, most as a producer, and it's been mostly for cultural institutions. Uh, I'm working with artists who do the projection mapping, uh, either with Chica, with Matt Parker, with Matt, uh, Matt Felsen. I th uh, that's a good question because a lot of the people tell me, ask me like, so are you an artist? And I learned that I'm an artist lately. I mean, <laughs> you, don't need to, you don't need to go the whole story, but it's like, I guess I am an artist, sure. Uh, so it doesn't really translate it to, oh, let them put a frame here. I don't know how to do art first, like, uh, because I cannot just put this in the art first. 
So to your point, I find interesting that it can be on print. That's why I value the paper so much or things that can be tangible at some point because that's kind of like the only way that I can show what the project was about. And images, they do show, but sometimes not so much. And it's a lot about the connections of the communities that get made while they're doing the project, I guess. I really like the distinction you made on like non-human centered design, like a lot of human centered design. But I'm curious if you know of any projects where there was like projection mass nature on like a cityscape or something like that. So have you thought about that? Or? So did, I mean, in a way, I, um, I must say that that's not me making it up. It's like a lot of people are doing biomimicry design. Uh, uh, design is by nature, including going many different directions, uh, including a lot of trains that are designed by the beak of a hummingbird, for instance, to make them mm -hmm. go faster. Uh, and I know for projection mapping, Camera Obscura, Obscura projection mapping company out of San Francisco, they did the Empire State Building, projecting images of nature uh, two years ago, and they did in the Vatican as well, which I was very jealous, I must say. Uh, <laughs> but it's like, I'm glad they are doing it. Uh, and also at the Met we wanted to do something outside and it seems the new director is excited to do that so I guess it might be interesting to see what they do with that. So those are the examples I know. How do you measure your success if you have sent in the design? I, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure how would I... Uh, I, it's been quite interesting, I mean this project I started the putting gardens on buses, I started uh, eight years ago and it's, I, it's, rather than measuring the success, I find it interesting that it's still uh, <laughs> relevant and that we haven't seen it come out. It's still relevant with so many things, internet time going so fast, that it still resonates with people. So I guess I find that interesting or even the temple of like some projects they feel like they, they last longer, like they people find interest in them. So I guess that would be measure of success and also if, it may, if it's rewarding for me. Like this one, is, uh, it was very rewarding and it's been rewarding to see, for instance, with the biobots, with the science lab, kids would be walking by and be like, mom, look, that's a, that's a garden on top of the bus. And the mom, obviously, she's tired, jaded, New York City. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pulling the kid. <laughs> And it's not real, it's fake, like, of all those things. And the kid's like, no, it's real. And then the, and it's like, yeah, it's real. They just go, look, it's real. And they, they come and the mom has changes, again, changes the perception. If I can help people imagine new possib the possibilities, I think that's rewarding for me. I don't know how to measure that. Mm -hmm. um, I really like your uh, film slice project. And my grandma has a lot of like, old slides that help store that help her house at home too. So, but I never thought of presenting that way. So, how did you come up with this form of um, present? I think uh, this was, uh, again, working with what you have, working with the resources you have around. We had a lot of slides, like cabinets and cabinets, and they, they were like, uh, my colleague and I would joke that it was the original JPEG because that was, uh, that was the physical, tangible JPEG. And if we were at Media Labs, so we were like, look all these JPEGs that we have, it's amazing. <laughs> we're like, nobody's doing anything with them. How do you do that? So it's like, right now people are doing open access data where people have access to libraries of images. So we kind of did that we're in the physical analog way. Like artists, uh, it was more, uh, four artists that came and just had access to all these images. And they, they're the ones who deserve all the credit to creating these installations. I just knew I couldn't throw them away. Like I, they were in my space, it was a space probably like this size. Uh, I need, I could use the space for more people. The slides were there, but I couldn't, it's like the quality of it. It's really putting it in a light or in a window. It's amazing what you can do with film. Uh, which makes me think like, how do we preserve things for the future? Which uh, that's a whole other conversation that I don't want to Like when everything is possible and anything, how do we design now for the future? Cool. Thank you so much, Marco.